everybody. It's very exciting to see now the, the, the studies and some results already to be presented. So let, we, we talked to the presenters, I uh, exchanged emails, so we agreed uh, we, we have a 20 minute presentation for each one and then 10 minutes discussion after the presentation. So we start with Samuel, Samuel Campbell presenting child labor and learning outcomes in agricultural households in Cote d'Ivoire. So let's start with Samuel, please Samuel. All right, so let me just share my screen. I'll use slides. I know Steve Jobs once said that if you use slides, then you don't know what you're talking about, but excuse me for today, I use slides. <laughs> okay, so um, can you see my screen? Can you see the slides? Not, yeah, now, yes. yes. Yes, you can see. All right, thank you so much. My name is Samuel Kembu, um, and uh, I'm, I'm a lecturer uh, at Lausanne University, a lecturer in economics. That's, that's, my, that's where my training is. Uh, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, that's actually my first time of presenting in, so many peop uh, in front of so many people, even if it's virtual, but uh, we have 100 people online. Thank you so much for your time. So I'm going to share the results from an ongoing uh, research effort to measure the, the, the impact of multi-sectoral approaches to child labor alleviation uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so my talk today is on uh, Child labor and schooling outcomes, uh, a portion of the work that was uh, generously uh, supported as part of my ILO uh, uh, fellowship under the ITA project. And I, I also want to take this opportunity to thank them for the financial support. So the work is co authored uh, by, uh, by Sharon Wolf um, from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Kaya Yachinska from the University of Toronto, and Amy Ogan from Carnegie Mellon uh, University. And um, so together we are the principal investigators of, uh, of, of a global research uh, program that I will briefly touch base on during the presentation. And I'm particularly uh, grateful to Sharon who also served as my mentor under the fellowship. So an overview of what, uh, I, I mean, how I'll be using the time. So I'll start with an intro uh, to briefly discuss our research questions and methods. Um, and then I will provide some description of the data uh, and show you some results, very simple presentation. The results, I'll first start with the prevalence of child work in our sample and then highlight differences between groups. I'll use child demographics and conclude with our findings on risk factors of, of child work and schooling decisions. So let's start. Uh, worldwide, we know, you know, I mean, these uh, statistics are available everywhere, 160 million children in the world engage in uh, child work with 79 million uh, endorsing hazardous work. So if we even consider recent attempts to harmonize uh, child labor statistics, and this is an effort, for instance, to which Sharon has contributed, the, num the number is, is, is even likely to be significantly larger. So the, the data are provided by the ILO Department of Statistics and other international agencies. So what that same report showed was that 70% of child labor globally, and if you focus on, sub -Saharan, uh, on the sub-Saharan Africa region, 85% of child labor in the region is concentrated in one sector, which is agricultural sector. Now, if we go in the agricultural sector, we know, uh, I mean, you are, I'm sure you all uh, know about cocoa as the raw material for chocolate, which is one of the most traded product in the world. And Cote d'Ivoire, uh, is one of the, I mean, is the world leader, the world's champion, as we like to call it, for cocoa exportation. So this work is actually uh, to document uh, child labor uh, in uh, the cocoa sector, prevalence and determinant. And we have a sample of vulnerable households who live in uh, cocoa growing regions of Cote d'Ivoire. So let's, you know, just take our flight, fasten our seat belts, and travel to Cote d'Ivoire. The prevalence of child labor is estimated there to be around uh, 33%. And this was uh, something that was based on, on studies uh, done in uh, 2020 uh, and based on uh, data from 2018. It was uh, uh, commissioned by the, the US Department of Labor and prepared by the NOC at the University of Chicago. And they concluded that 33% of child labor uh, of children, sorry, in, in, uh, in agricultural regions of the country engage in child labor. Uh, and then they find a similar percentage in engaging in hazardous work. <clears throat> so 
we use the same instrument as them. Uh, and I'll be reporting on what we find uh, in a minute. Uh, one thing that I just want you to keep in mind is that the prevalence has risen uh, since, since the, the, uh, the prevalence has risen, had risen in 2018 when they conducted the survey. So compared to 20, uh, 2008. So let me just step, stop here in a minute to re-emphasize, of course, because I know there are policymakers online uh, that these figures actually call for immediate attention given the accumulated knowledge so far on the consequences of child labor. Uh, I mean, we know it has detrimental consequences on the health, on, the, on learning outcomes of children, if I, I, I had only to mention those two. And uh, again, on you know, uh, human capital accumulation and, and macroeconomic uh, 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 growth of, of a given country. Uh, but then I also want to emphasize the fact that there are things that we don't know. Uh, there are some evidence gaps, whether in Cote d'Ivoire or globally. Uh, one is on child labor and COVID-19. I mean, linking the two requires a set of pre-pandemic uh, data or whether, I mean, or being able to at least reconstruct the data that we often don't have. So the data that I'm going to show you has the advantage that we collected it in 2021 uh, during and in the aftermath of the pandemic. So we use it to answer the questions around involvement in domestic economic and agricultural activities in the family. The second evidence gap uh, is around you know, child labor alleviation policies in the context, uh, the effectiveness of those policies in Cote d'Ivoire. And that's the effort that Sharon, Kaya, and uh, Amy and I are, are leading uh, to assess the impact of two child labor alleviation policies. One of them is cash transfers, and the other one is education improvement. And the name of our project is SEME. Um, and it's important because the data that I'm presenting to you, to you uh, today, I mean, the results is retrieved from uh, our baseline data uh, where we have um, much more that, that I'm going to show you now. So our research questions first, we have three questions uh, that we're able to, I mean, leverage the data to answer. Uh, the first one is, we wanted to find out, you know, what was simply the prevalence of child labor uh, during and aftermath of the COVID pandemic. Second, we wanted to assess how that prevalence uh, uh, varied by demographic groups. Uh, and we focus here on gender and age differences. That's what uh, I'll be referring to as demographic. Uh, but in the paper, we have more groups. Uh, so I will not uh, be, be sharing the data on, the, on other groups. And third, we also wanted to you know, identify the main risk factors of child labor and schooling decisions uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. So now thinking at, at, the, at the level of the, at the family. So as an ILO fellow, I was a research fellow for the, under the RTA project. The, 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 the project generously supported my time to conduct an extensive literature review on risk factors of child labor globally. I can share it if people are interested. And I know uh, you also have uh, the, the, the evidence map. I saw that we can add some papers on Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, second, I will also, I mean, I'll be, it supported me to provide the descriptive stats uh, on the prevalence of child labor in our sample to inform uh, that, that will certainly inform the research and policy debate uh, on child labor during COVID. And third, to, to, to uh, develop a multinomial logistic framework uh, to uh, analyze uh, uh, risk factors of families' decisions. So uh, the data comes from a large number of communities. We actually have 140 uh, communities in the, in the study in the center west uh, and southeast regions of the country. These are highly cocoa growing regions. We have data from almost uh, 1,800 children uh, and they are female caregivers. So basically we have one focal child and the woman taking care of that person. And for each household, we collect you know, a battery of child and caregiver level information. So let me show you some descriptive stats in this slide and the next one. First, uh, on child characteristics, so I've grouped them. Uh, the average child is nine year old in the sample. The youngest is five and the oldest is 15. Uh, and there is an equal proportion of boys and girls um, uh, and 84% of, uh, of children in our sample are currently enrolled in school. On household factors, the average mother is uh, 41 in the sample. The average household has 6.5 people. That's what you can see on the, on the numbers on the screen. Uh, we have a dependency ratio at 20%, quite similar to what uh, you, you find in other uh, research in the context. So basically in 10 people in a household, two will be dependent, dependent in the sense that uh, they are too young, so below six, they cannot basically participate to economic 
participate economically and uh, all dependent because they are too old, uh, above 65. And then you have, I mean, this is a sample also where 73% uh, of mothers are biological mothers of focal children. This is important. I mean, it was important also for the domestic work that we were discussing in a moment. Um, and um, mothers are educated. I mean, not so educated, sorry, only 31% 30, are educated and 31% of fathers are educated. These households are mostly led by male uh, and, and um, uh, they, they mostly rely on cocoa for their subsistence for 78%. Um, second, I think that's really an originality of this work is that we were able to account for a great range of scores of, of poverty scores. We have one which is a, a deprivation score, multi-dimensional poverty index, and the second one which is poverty probability index. And we include we include this the two in our in our analysis to see how it affects uh, child labor and schooling decisions. So the first MPI are also referred to in the literature as the Achille Foster uh, index is at 0 0.5. Basically, what it tells you uh, is that the, the family is highly deprived. Um, so the indicator is weighted basically on this on a couple of uh, factors. Uh, education, health, and living standards. Those are the three factors that we uh, consider. And the higher the indicator, the higher the level of deprivation. And 0 0.5 already means that it is you are highly uh, deprived. Second, we also measure the poverty probability index, which is a poverty scorecard that was developed by uh, Innovation for Poverty Action. And it assesses basically the likelihood that a given household is below a given poverty line. Uh, so we took $1.9 per day poverty line, and the higher the score again for an individual, the higher the likelihood that she is likely to be poor. And when you average that, you get uh, a poverty uh, score on your sample. And in our case, it's 58% of the sample, which is, which is very high. It's actually higher by 10 percentage point uh, than the national poverty rate in Cote d'Ivoire. So lastly, uh, you can see uh, that we also computed uh, PPI and MPI now the village level, and well, they are quite they are quite uh, comparable to uh, what we have at the individual level, and uh, the survey variables are there just to give you you know uh, a sense of how many um, data we had from each of the regions. We had thirty four percent from Bafle, forty two percent from Daloa, and and twenty three percent from from, uh, from Miyagi. All right, let me turn to the results. Uh, so again, I will present the prevalence uh, of child labor, the, the, the differences between groups and the risk factors. So, all right, um, our work, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the survey, we have a child work module, uh, which, was, which allowed us to really collect a large battery of uh, uh, domestic, economic, and farm work activities. So for domestic and economic, um, the, the thing that you, I want you to have in mind and also linking to the presentation that we had yesterday is that we, we don't have a very clear framework you know, that allows us to classify it as child labor. And there is a 2014 legal framework uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. I actually saw that the ILO had supported that, that forbids, for instance, any domestic uh, activity for children below 16. And you will agree with me that is very difficult. So building on that, what we are capturing on domestic activity could actually be child labor. So uh, uh, we we'll do our homework and meet with policymakers on this to better streamline the definition of domestic and economic. However, for farm activity, we, we have a clear framework on which we can build and, and define it as child labor. So if I'm using child work is simply you know, to, to make the distinctions in our mind. All right, so uh, as you see on the slide, I have put result on domestic, economic, farm, and hazardous uh, child labor activity. And um, you have the sample size, the mean, the standard deviation, median, and the, the maximum uh, number of uh, possible activities. What you have is the mean and in parentheses, the percentage. The percentage is, actu is actually simply giving you the amount, the, the, the number of, uh, the percentage of uh, children reporting doing at least one of those activities. So let's start with domestic work. So what, what we have on a total of 10 activities, children actually perform an average of four. And those activities are things like, you know, buying goods for the family, washing clothes, cleaning appliances, collecting water, uh, uh, among others. Uh, and 87% of children perform at least one domestic activity. 
Uh, and, and I will show you that they actually start when they are very young from, from age five. On economic work uh, inside the household, which basically captures involvement in, in household business, we have a total of five activities that, should, that kids can, can perform. And we see that on average, they perform less than one. Uh, so those activities are things like you know, manage or do any business, be, I mean, for the, for the family, do any work for pay, uh, work as a domestic worker for wage and so on. Uh, and then we see that 39% of children in our sample perform at least one economic activity. On farm activity, we have a total of 36 uh, activities that can enter uh, the child labor uh, definition as characterized by local law. And on average, we, we have that children perform five uh, on uh, uh, activities and two of them are hazardous work. So the non-hazardous work are things like your know, collection and peeling of pots, uh, breaking of, of cocoa pots for fermentation, drying of cocoa and weeding, and stuff like that. But we also have hazardous, and I will show you in the next slides that uh, actually if a child does only, no, not in the next slide, but in the coming slide, that actually if, if a child does only one of those, he's considered as a child labor. And uh, in our sample, kids are, are actually do, doing an average of two. And those are things like weeding or pruning with machetes or knives, breaking cocoa pots with knives, uh, and, 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 and so on. And I can also talk to you about other hazardous activities that are not really, that are not found in our sample. But overall, we have, you know, one child in two uh, uh, who is considered, who, who is considered doing a, a potential child labor activity, and for sure, 34.5% who are child laborers, uh, in the sense that they performed at least one uh, hazardous farm activity. We cannot directly compare these rates, of course, to previous ones, but uh, the bottom line is that they look particularly high and, of course, in our view, call for immediate attention. So now moving to the number of activities by demographic group, so I'm moving in my presentation to the second set of questions that we had. So we provide in this graph, the next one and the table in the table in the third, in the, in the third slide from now, uh, how child labor varies by, by uh, the, the, the gender of the child. So what I show on the slide is empirical cumulative density function. Uh, so it's basically a cumulative function where you count the number of observations below a certain point. So it can allow you to, to, to elegantly depict relationship between cumulative dis distributions. So what the way you should read it is that if a curve is below, uh, that, that means the population there is larger for the same number of activities. And what you see is that the ECGF, uh, which stands for empirical cumulative density function for, for girls, the ECGF of girls in domestic work is below that of boys. So that's the first thing I wanted to note. And then the ECGF of boys in farm work, uh, whether it's hazardous, hazardous or not, because uh, I have on the one side hazardous and the other side I have, has, um, I have on the one side, sorry, all child labor uh, in the farm uh, sector and uh, uh, close to it hazardous. So what you see on the slide is that the, the, the ECGF of boys is, uh, is below uh, that of girls. So what is telling us is that boys do uh, more farm work while girls do more domestic work. This might seem straightforward, but it's not. Uh, we saw that in other contexts, it's actually the reverse that is happening. Uh, the evidence from, you know, I mean, there's evidence from Ghana, from Pakistan, and somebody even presented something else in, in uh, from, uh, I can't remember the, the country, but the, the evidence was that girls were working more in the farm. So on the difference between age cohort, we have this uh, slide that shows the difference between uh, kids based on whether they are uh, able to go to school yet or not. So we have the cutoff at six. And what we see once again is that, well, Children that are very young actually perform significantly less child uh, labor activities than kids that are uh, that are six years uh, and above. Now I wanted to Samuel, yes. apologize, apologize, interrupt you, but let you know we have three minutes left. All right, okay. I will be able to wrap up. So on the, on this slide, I'm providing you with more data. Um, so I, I left it on purpose just to be able to have a magnitude of these uh, differences. So what you see on the slide is that on economic, you don't have that much difference, but on farm work, uh, boys actually perform almost twice uh, as much activities as girls. Uh, and the same happens for hazardous where boys 
might be performing uh, almost almost three times. What happened with the age, and that's one thing I want you to, 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 to keep in mind, is that you have uh, a monotonic increase. So basically, the, the, the number of activities significantly increases with age, and you have some cutoff points. This is what is depicted, oh, sorry. This is what is depict, depicted, sorry, on this, on, this, um, uh, on this figure, where you have an increasing pattern for all, but uh, depending on the on on the, on a particular age, the number of activities jumps significantly. So, for instance, uh, between five and six, the number of activities jumps by seventy two percent for domestic work, uh, by four hundred percent for economic work, and by one hundred and sixteen percent for farm work. This is interesting because it actually shows that depending on your age, you might not have the same uh, likelihood of. Of, of, of doing much more uh, uh, activities. Now, to conclude on, uh, on what we find on, uh, uh, on uh, 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 farm work. So I, I have this definition of uh, child labor, which is the way, I mean, you should operationalize it in Cote d'Ivoire. The child, if he's between five and 11, he has to work at least one hour uh, between 12 and 14, between 15 and 17. So the cutoffs are different. But on the other side, if the child performs at least one of the hazardous uh, labor activities, he is considered a laborer. So you can take all that and group the decisions between uh, uh, schooling and uh, work with uh, either the child, uh, sorry, either the family having the child involved in schooling only, or the family having the three other options, which is having the child only working or the child combining work and school. And lastly, you can also imagine that the family can have the child not working and not being in school. And the, the table provides uh, uh, results on uh, uh, of a multinomial uh, logic model. So the reference category is school only. And for those who are familiar with these models, basically you should interpret each category. So work and school, compared to the reference category, work only to the reference category, and no work, no school to the reference category. So if you only look at the table, the, 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 the sign would give you an idea of, of, on, the, on the, 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 whether the relationship is positive or negative. And uh, we, are pro we have provided you with odd ratio, which basic, basically give you an idea of the, on the magnitude of the effect. So what we find here is that boys, again, are more likely to be uh, uh, working, either, either working only or combining work and school, much more likely than girls. Uh, all the children are also more likely to, to perform uh, uh, more uh, farm activities. And on household factors, this is one thing that is new, we see that uh, as, as uh, a child is having an older parent, he's more likely to be working only instead of schooling only. This is probably because uh, uh, adult household member might be substituting uh, their own uh, labor for child uh, labor. And uh, we do find that children living with their biological parents are more likely to work in school, which is probably explained by the fact that, uh, you know, um, the, 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 our sample is much more made of, of people living with their biological parents. And on a different sample, maybe we would have found uh, different uh, results. Now on the Poverty scores, uh, what we find is that the MPI, which is the multidimensional multi poverty index, and the PPI actually affect uh, household decisions in very different way. The MPI score affects the decisions between work only and school only, and also the decision between not working and not schooling and school only. Why the, the PPI affects the, dec the decision of combining work and school versus school only, and uh, not working and, and not schooling versus school only. This is important because the, the meaning is not the same. So our results actually call for more multifaceted approaches. The, the, what, you had, what you have in the, in the MPI is much more than, than, uh, than, than poverty. It's about you know, a family who has lost a family member, uh, which is the health, uh, health, health part of the, of the MPI. Or, access to, uh, to very basic, basic uh, uh, elements in the household. So I've provided you with so, some results on the prevalence of uh, and risk factors of child labor and schooling decisions. Uh, and um, 
I've shown you that uh, results, uh, child labor significantly varies by demographic groups. And actually, I want to highlight that what we are finding is very consistent with earlier work. And uh, I've also discussed briefly uh, child labor decisions uh, and what are their precipitating factors between child, household, and community factors. On, I, I, I didn't mention it, but at the community level, we found that uh, the child labor in the cluster, so whether a family lives in a cluster where there's too much child labor, actually, actually uh, 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 mediates uh, the fact that the family also uses child labor. So we had an, an excellent presentation yesterday on social norms. That's our preferred interpretation for the role of community factors. So in our next steps, uh, I mean, uh, we are happy to, be sh to share the paper, but we are going to streamline the child labor definition, account for risk factors, and, and consider alternative modeling approaches. So thank you so much for uh, your time. So over to you. Thank you, Samuel. No, no, this is great. Uh, well, I, I, will, I will refrain myself. We have already three hands raised. So <laughs> let's start with Santa Darshan Sadhu, and then, then Ana Montes, and then Fernando Chima. So let's, let's take, uh, so I'll do the following. I'll take three questions and then go over to you, and you answer the, the, the three ones, and then the the, the people that want to make questions, then we go go again. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot, Samuel, for presenting this very interesting study. And uh, I'm very excited to see that you have followed up in, you know, uh, in Kotibur to understand the prevalence of child labor, which will definitely something which, uh, you know, we kind of proposed in our research work for what we actually developed under North. I have two quick questions, uh, specifically on understanding the prevalence rates and the comparison in between. Uh, you mentioned that in your sample, uh, the children are mostly between five to 15. Uh, is, they, is that true? Uh, I mean, or, ha, I, or am I interpreting it differently? Uh, and then uh, what was the reference period when you collected the child labor data? What was the reference period? So these are the two questions. I may have an additional one, but I'll leave the floor to others right now. Anna, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samuel. It was, it's very interesting uh, research, I, I find. I have a, a quick question slash comment or, or suggestion. Um, I was very interested about this last thing that you said, that, uh, and I was wondering what, how do you explain that uh, the poverty index affects positively uh, or explains positively or is associated positively with no work and no school category? And maybe I'm thinking about already the, an idea is that maybe the household is so impoverished that they cannot even send the, the kid to school or to work. So one idea or one, one maybe suggestion is maybe break down this poverty index into like categories so you can see this hypothesis, whether the, even this is a most impoverished uh, um, households, they, they cannot even uh, afford uh, transport or, or or, or the parent uh, works so long that they cannot even take the children to school or uh, some other reasons uh, um, behind it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Fernanda, do uh, you still want to make questions or? It was an applause. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, Thank okay. You. All right. So please, Samuel. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Sadhu, for joining the, the, the presentation today. And thank you so much for your question. So as you know, we used your instrument, the instrument that you developed under the NOC uh, for uh, farm uh, child labor activities. Yes, our children are between five and 15, so you are right. Uh, so the tool is actually uh, tailored to that sample. Uh, and uh, we would be, uh, I mean, you, you saw the, that I even took the picture that you had on the report in the report on how you operationalize the index, the, 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 the child labor. Um, and uh, what uh, I, I mean, I didn't show a result on the hazardous child labor, but they are pretty the same. Um, uh, but we would be using uh, child labor for kids who are between um, five and 12 uh, and, and looking whether they had at least one activity. 
And our reference period is actually, uh, we have two. We have the past uh, seven days, just as you had operationalized it, and the past 12 months. So we would be, uh, for, for, ch for children age five to, to 12, for sure we are able to assess whether they had, they spend at least one hour because we asked them whether they were, they were involved with at least one activity. And, and if that's the case, we know that the activity, uh, the question is framed in a way that they did at least one hour. So for, for them, for sure we can assess. But then if the child is above 12, that's where uh, we are going to think differently because we didn't ask the, the length of involvement in child labor activities. So that's where our results are likely to be uh, a bit uh, different from, from, I mean, in the, in the operationalizing of the, uh, of the index. The second aspect to answer to that question is that we'll be focusing on hazardous and for hazardous, for sure, we know that if the child has at least one, uh, then this is child labor. Uh, so those are the two avenues in which I might answer the, the I mean, the question and the reference period, I think I also answered it. Yeah, I just have one follow up, you know, comment yeah. here for mm -hmm. the for the greater audience. <clears throat> uh, the, the problem I see in the, not the problem, the issue I see here is that uh, since you have focused only up to age 15 for rightly so for the school age, I, I think school going age basically focus on that particular focus. Uh, it may not be comparable with our numbers because it is an underestimation. You know, if we do not include 16 and 17, where the exposure to hazard, as you can see in our report, is the highest. So that's what that's a that's a caveat we probably have to use when we make the comparison. Uh, the number you have is a lower limit. Definitely, you know, uh, it will be much higher if we include that 16 and 17 group. Thank you uh, so much. Here. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. That, that's, uh, and that's the point I was trying to make in the presentation, that it's, it's very hard to compare the two. Not, not uh, I mean, the point on, on age should definitely also go into our writing, but we also had the, the fact that we are not covering the same periods. I mean, you, you, you need also to have uh, more preconditions in, in order to be able to compare the two uh, uh, samples. But the good thing is, I mean, the, not the good thing, but at least what we found, on, especially on hazardous, the fact that 34% of children are getting involved in hazardous, and as you say, it's a lower bound, it actually means that it, you have to worry about, right? And it, it, we were collecting it during during COVID period, and I mean, we have some reason to think that it, it probably increased, uh, child labor probably increased uh, as, as, uh, as, as a result of the pandemic. So thank you so much. Uh, and for following up. Thank you, Sadra, I appreciate it. Uh, so Hannah, I mean, your question, uh, we are still thinking about how to, you know, interpret all the, the precipitating factors that we found. And to be honest with you, I, I won't say I have the, the clear answer because we still have to, in a sense, go in the literature. I know that there were, the, what, what the literature has so far is that uh, poverty affects the, uh, the decision between working and schooling. And not necessarily between not working and not schooling and schooling, right? So we have to think about what could be the mechanism. And to be honest, at this stage, I would say I don't know. Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, and uh, we'll be digging more into the literature and you know looking for possible explanations of that. So thank you so much for your question, and also thank you for suggesting how we can find that out. Because uh, by breaking down the index, as you said, we might know whether I know. I mean, it's due. I don't know. The, the good news is that for the MPI, for instance, we have, we can break down the indicator by, you know, whether it is more induced by uh, education, by, uh, by uh, living standards, by health, you know, and, and just analyze the path. So thank you so much. Thanks, Samuel. We, we have passed our time, but we have two people with their hands up. So I will pass for, take this two and, and you answer very quickly, Samuel. Okay. And then Sounds good. Answer, okay. okay. I'll take so, it very quickly. Let's go to Inga Bonziza, Elisa, and then Lorenzo. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want, I want first to thank the presenter, Samuel, for the good presentation he made. Uh, I want to, to take this as a question. I want to ask Mr. Samuel if if his research was he, he he just made on on one sector that's it, agriculture there are, there is a, there, are, there are other activities like mining where there is there is a, 
where they influence child labor. So I want to, 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 to ask if he just focused on agriculture only. Thank you very much. That was my question. Thank you. Should I answer or should we take uh, Lorenzo's questions? Lorenzo's question. Let's take Lorenzo. Is that okay, Lorenzo? Okay. Yeah, I am. Uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, thanks, Samuel. Um, more than a question, maybe is um, is a comment on um, the relationship between poverty or multidimensional poverty and uh, the, the four uh, categories. Actually, the theory says that uh, it, it may happen. The poorest the family is, the more likely is that a child neither study nor uh, uh, work because of, uh, uh, I think Anna was saying also before, uh, uh, cannot have the even the, the the money to afford to take the bus to go to um, to workplace and and there is a literature there because it is really linked to the um, theory of the house of decision mechanism i can send you a couple this can help you in the interpretation actually of uh, uh, some of the res results Okay. And then a suggestion uh, uh, I have, I mean, I have to look better to a couple of, um, of the, the results you show. By suggestion, if you can also calculate uh, the marginal effect to look also at the effect on studying only, because this can give you also an additional insight on, on uh, let's say, the shift between the four activities and see where this uh, uh, effect is higher. Um, that's also interesting for thinking, I mean, to policy on what can be done. And I don't know uh, what you have in your data set, but do you have information on household assets? I will try, if you are not able to distinguish in all the categories of the um, two index here for poverty, Maybe just to build uh, an asset index uh, and see how this relate with uh, with this variable can help also. Wow. Okay, I think these are these Lorenzo's are more comments, very great comments, uh, and uh, I I mean we can we can continue uh, touching based on that Lorenzo um, in through the program and. I'll be glad to receive any paper that we share. So in the interest of time, I'll briefly re reply to Elisa. Uh, yes, we are mostly focused on the cocoa sector, even though uh, we are asking, I mean, a broad set of questions, which also cover domestic and what quote unquote we call economic, which are around involvement in, uh, in, uh, family, in family business, uh, which can, you know, can be uh, anything outside cocoa uh, in a sense. So that's it. And Lorenzo, I will definitely write to you to, to follow up on this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.